So hi everyone, um, my name is Corinne and I'm based in Berlin. Um, I work for Steel Point Spaces as a site coordinator and business development manager. And um, for those who don't know about Steel Point, about who we are, we are an international organization that aims at exploring the world of psychology in the related disciplines such as the art, uh, philosophy and the humanities with clinicians and non-clinicians. And our vision is to provide access to high quality psychologically based content um, through courses, through events and also professional services. And we do so, um, the way to access this content could be through our professional membership, which is mostly for counselors, psychotherapists, coaches, and the Explorer membership, which is more for non-professionals. And to keep everybody engaged and create a, ses a sense of belonging, we also created an online community. So you can actually find more information on our website uh, stillpoint.org and I'm really happy to have the opportunity to interview today Alfred who is the co-founder of the app Anyone which is an app that makes it easier to give and receive advice through five-minute phone calls. Um, I don't really want to give a biography I will let you introduce yourself but I can tell a little bit what was the connection so one of your one of the co-founder of anyone, Sam, also worked with us um, at Steel Point Spaces that really helped us when it comes to the tech and uh, the infrastructure that we had. We had an encrypted solution uh, and also our, our website. So he was really present when it comes to helping us with that. Um, and that created the link to anyone. And um, this is, I will say, one, the first series of um, us discussing work and the psychology of work. And since we had that connection with anyone, we thought that it would be interesting to uh, interview you um, and also understand what the app, what is the vision of the app, and also what is your view on work, career changes, taking leap of faith. Um, so I'd like to um, let you introduce yourself first. Um, yes. Hi, everyone. Um, it is uh, an absolute honor to be here today. I, my name is Alfred. I'm originally from Sweden. I live in uh, the UK and the US for about 15 years soon. Um, I spent um, the first kind of formative years uh, of my career in advertising and then about a decade at Google. Um, doing marketing and building products. Um, the majority of the time I spent at a team called Jigsaw, which built technology to make people in the world safer. So we worked a lot with activists and dissidents and journalists around the world in repressive societies um, in order to build kind of cybersecurity solutions for them um, to uh, be safer um, in their activism. Uh, I then started to get together with two others. Anyone about I think it's almost two years now, um, time has flown by um, and we are at a stage now where um, we have built up uh, quite an incredible community of both advisors and callers, um, a lot of time it overlaps, um, who are calling each other daily for advice in the shape of five minute phone calls. That sounds amazing and I have so many questions, don't even know where to start. Um, <laughs> Um, so I also know that through your LinkedIn that you worked at Google uh, before quite quite for some time, um, and it seems to me that it is your first uh, company. That's the first company that you founded. Um, and so, how did you implement that change? How do you? How were you able to be in this? mindset that, okay, you had the experience at Google and then decide to become an entrepreneur? Uh, well, link, LinkedIn is not a true representation of, of my past. That, that's kind of the, um, uh, the filtered version. Um, when I left Google, I was, I knew that I wanted to leave Google, but I didn't know what I wanted to do. Um, so first I took quite some time off. Um, I read a lot. 
Uh, and then I started a bunch of different things uh, to see what I liked uh, doing. And mm -hmm. anyone was kind of the winner that came out on top. But it was uh, quite a diverse group of things I was doing. I was doing a think tank that was going to focus on economic inequality. Um, I started a wine glass brand because I wanted to learn how, how that kind of um, direct to consumer, as it called, um, the kind of business model works. Um, I, um, yeah, I, I did a bunch of different things uh, and even thought about becoming an author. So I, um, I, I wrote a book that I pitched to, um, I think, 35 agents, got, got 30, uh, 30 people ignored me, five replied that I should definitely not be a writer, uh, which was fantastic. Um, and then meanwhile, I think all of these things coming together kind of helped shape what, what anyone became, um, especially all kind of like the work I did in economic inequality um, and realized that one of, the, one of the biggest things I wanted to tackle um, was access to, um, to great advice. Um, I had a, a, the thing that, that made me the most scared about leaving Google was the access I had to people and how many people would take meetings. Uh, virtually anyone you reached out to would say, um, yes, uh, and would give you their time because um, they found you interesting, basically based on your CV without knowing you. Um, and I thought that that was kind of one of the kind of biggest things to tackle in the world was how to give the access I had um, at a fantastic um, kind of moment in my career to everyone. Because um, I realized that what I was learning from meeting uh, all these people should be available to much more people. And, and there are people who would need did more than I did at that moment in time. But it was one of the things that made me the most scared about leaving Google was losing the access to people and, and the network um, possibilities that it brought. Um, and we saw that, I, we realized that that was a design challenge um, and that the reason why it's hard to get people's time is kind of the nature of what you're asking for and how hard it is to, to actually reach out to them and find their email addresses and whatnot. Um, so that, that it kind of all came together to become anyone. But to answer your question, I had no idea. Uh, and I was in a very fortunate position that, that not a lot of people have that I'd saved up money so I could take time off to figure it out. And um, I actually really like that you've done so many different things because I think a lot of people probably think, oh, how did you manage? Like sometimes it, you have this fear of like, what is the next step? But it's like to figure out your next step, you actually probably will have to try different thing, like the wine, the book or whatever, and then go to what stick or sometimes just a vision or something will get actually clearer. So I find that super interesting. And I wonder how long did it take you so how long did this, this period of like experimenting, figure out what was interesting to you and then decided to go to build anyone? What was the time period? Um, so I think it was, it was about a year that I did nothing. Um, well, which is not completely true. I had a daughter. Um, so I spent um, the first year of her life with her, which was fantastic. Um, but I didn't do anything work related. Um, and then I probably spent six months trying out different things and anyone was kind of conceived at that time uh, and then I did I didn't start working full-time on anyone until like a year later so it was a year that I was working on all of the different things um, and then anyone suddenly started to really take shape um, and started to get I started to see the potential of it so it was probably a year into that um, that it became like completely full-time um, and yeah, so it's probably been the last year that I've been on it nonstop. That is really good. And um, to me, it seemed like you already had this mindset. Because I think to be able to make changes, as you say, um, mo money is definitely a factor because then people will think, can I, can I afford actually to take this time or if you have a family or if you have kids do I have the support system to be able to experiment so there's just so many different parameters um so what would you say 
for somebody who would like to also make a, a shift, what would you say is like the, how would you prepare the ideal environment to be able to make shifts? Yeah, uh, that, that's, that's a great question. I think <clears throat> one thing as well, which, which I, I, didn't, I, I didn't know what I wanted to do, but I, I had a very good idea what I didn't want to do um, when I left. I think I realized that I'd, I had worked 10 years in a corporate environment and I'd, I'd realized what was giving me stress and anxiety about that. Um, and that I'd been working pretty much half my life um, to understand the politics of organizations and the interpersonal uh, relationships um, and all that stuff. And I think it was, I was fairly good at it. I, I managed to have a good career. <clears throat> but I didn't realize how much energy took out of me um, and how damaging it was to, to who I was. Um, so I knew that I, I could survive in organizations, but it, but it probably wasn't good for me. So the goal when I left was to, to not be in an organization and I was trying to figure out what to do um, in order to, to avoid that. So the goal was, was quite clear, but I didn't know how to achieve it. Um, and what kind of business models I would be good at or, or anything like that. And I think the only thing I knew I didn't want to do was a startup. I felt I was very done with technology and especially the, the industry. Um, and, and then I don't know if it was a failure that I ended up with a startup or if it was just actually what I should do because I had all that experience. Um, but back to your, to your actual question, the the way that um, I prepared for it, something that I'd long thought was um, that I didn't want to get, um, I was again very fortunate to have a, a decent income um, at Google. Uh, I was working in New York at the time, so the salaries were quite inflated as well. And I knew that I didn't want to be uh, dependent or, or dependent on that kind of income when I had a family. So I think for, for us, we left and we took that year and, and we made a very concerted effort to go back to um, a living standard um, where we could basically survive on a lot less money. Um, so that, that was something that we prepared for uh, and really planned for like how to, how to go back, something like that. Um, and and that, was, that was an interesting journey. And, and now when we sit, um, our lives now are, are fantastic and we're surviving on a completely different kind of, of money, but, and I'm, but my life is a lot better. Uh, and that's a bit of a cliche, but I think that was, um, that was something that I spent the most time on was actually to redesign my life, my expenses and, and how I lived. Um, it, it's an extremely privileged thing to sit and talk about, but that's, that was the truth. Um, and um, the other thing that I, that I really wanted to design was to, to basically have five, six hour work days um, and spend uh, the first half of the day when I enjoy working, working, and then have uh, as much time off as possible. So that kind of led into the choices of, uh, of different things that I was exploring was, was all stuff that wouldn't mean that I needed to be in an office or um, to, to be able to have like a flexible work life. And this was, pre-pandemic uh, and now it's it's been really interesting to follow that kind of discourse and debate around that because I identify a lot with it um, and we designed anyone to be remote first to be flexible um, where we would hire people based and based on their what they wanted to do and, and to really create a company around everyone's weak strengths um, because that would be a way that we wouldn't need to be in an office as much as if we had a top-down philosophy where everyone needed to adhere to something, then you need to be more in an office space. So now we have a completely remote team, which has its uh, benefits, but it's, um, it definitely has its challenges as well. But that was something that we consciously designed for from the beginning. And my co-founders were in Stockholm and Leeds at the time. Um, so when the pandemic hit, we were pretty well prepared for it. It's, it's kind of what we what a lot of people today uh, have discovered that they want is kind of what we wanted already. Yeah, and I, and I felt like everything <clears throat> that you said, so like the pandemic really accelerated um, people to uh, this sense of, I need to 
rethink my relationship with with work. I need to rethink what is important for me. Um, and I think that that really pushed people. Um, at least it accelerated the movement. Uh, so it's quite interesting, like the timing at which also the, the app was released a bit before. Um, that actually could answer this demand or this need to rethink, uh, to support people in, in their uh, thought process. And I wonder, because I know um, you mentioned a lot about economic inequality, who are usually the people that you see in your app? Um, on like, because we, because we're a marketplace, um, someone uh, joins as an advisor uh, and they create conversation topics that they want to advise on uh, and then they put a price on that time. Um, we, we have kind of two sides of it. So we have the callers who have, who needs advice and then we have advisors who, who obviously gives advice. Um, and the normal user on the advice side is people who are at a stage in a career where they want to give back and pay it forward but there are no platforms. Um, it's very hard um, uh, to actually, <clears throat> if you want to mentor, et cetera, um, but don't have the time, um, there's virtually no, uh, no service for you. So that's one of the things that we've kind of unlocked is, is to make giving back um, very easy. Um, so mo most people, there are people who are starting to feel that need that they want to pay it forward. Um, and then we, we also have um, a large group of, of advisors who want to pay it forward and get paid. Um, I think there, it's another thing that we've unlocked is that so many people every day, they kind of give out um, advice in a business context for free um, because people uh, take advantage of the fact that you can't charge for a 10 minute quick question or, hey, can I pick your brain? Hey, what do you think about this? Meanwhile, like that is something that people should charge for. Um, and there are a lot of people who are very awkward about charging for something like that or don't have the right formats to do it. Um, so that's on the advisor side. And on the caller side, we have both a lot of, of people who are just starting to have a lot of life events. So either starting families, they are mid-career and not sure about what they're doing. They either want to reach the next level or they want to pivot. Um, a lot of people who have just started their own business, who have just become freelancers. A lot of people who have big questions um, that they don't really know where to turn to for. Um, as well as, as quite a large group of, uh, of younger people um, who are um, also facing life events, events about what career do I choose? Um, and can I start my own business? Should I lean into my creativity or should I get, go the corporate path? Um, so there is, there is a wide range um, of people there, but um, I think something we owe, like from a, from a long-term perspective, I think one of the big things we're trying to do is, is to help people realize that we pretty much all need advice. Um, there are very few instances in life where we know everything. Um, and we have <clears throat> all the data information and capabilities to make um, the perfect, most informed. Oh my God, I scared off Tom. Um, I just get a notification when people leave. That's terrifying. Um, the, um, yeah, so I think we're, we're both kind of providing a direct service and need for people who I'm starting my own business. Um, I want, I need advice from these group of people about these, these things. But, but long term, we hope to also create more of a culture where, where people are more open and reflective and understand when they need advice and to be a platform for them and for more people. And how do people get to know your app? Because I understand the whole accessibility. I knew about the app through Steelborn, but it's just like, how, how can I know? Because I, I see what I see a lot when it comes to um, networks or different career is that sometimes um, people for more, um, I will say, uh, less privileged background, they don't even have the information about what is possible. Or sometimes yeah. it's, um, they can't even imagine that for them it's also possible. 
you know? So I, I, I wonder how do you access, talking about young people, how do you bring them to your app um, is a question that I have. Yeah, no, and, and that's a fantastic question. Um, and that's kind of, <clears throat> part, of me, part of part of my story and, and what has helped kind of inspire what anyone is, is that I grew up in a in a small part, a small town in a small part of Sweden, which is a small country. Um, uh, I had terrible grades because I didn't enjoy school very much. And I started working in advertising because my godfather was basically said, you need to get your shit together why don't you do advertising? I did advertising, it was fine. Um, and I did advertising. And I, you know, 10 years later, when I had done a whole career in advertising and marketing, I was like, what if someone had said something else? What if someone had told me, oh, you could do this, or you could do this? Have you ever heard about this? Um, I would have been somewhere, pro probably somewhere completely different because advertising um, is not a passion of mine at all. Um, and I realized that if I, as a 17, 18 year old, had had this app like available and I could just have scrolled the feed and seen all these professions, seen all these people, um, and I could, they would be a phone call away, um, my life would have been very different because just by having access to those people, I could have called someone in finance. What's that like? Oh, not for me. I could have called someone in law. Oh, not for me. I could have called, you know, a tech investor. I was like, oh, that's interesting. So you actually help fund brilliant ideas. Wow, I could have become that. Um, and so for me, I kind of like when I look back, so many moments were just completely based on chance and who I happened to meet at the time. And that feels like a design problem. And, and for me, I, I come like my mother was a designer, my dad was a consultant. So I in no way come from um, from a background where, where like, where I can say that I didn't have opportunity, but it was still so much filled with chance. Um, and I think now looking at, at um, um, young people and the talent um, that you can see out there, who if you tell them like just the other day, I told someone about how to do a startup, and it was the first conversation they had in their life about it, um, and they were in business school, um, and so. I think that's kind of like oh, what we're trying to do with the app. Um, you can't really find us at the moment. Um, we're purposefully small and it's, it's closed. Um, it's, it's also a huge um, challenge that we are learning about every single day, the responsibility that we have where we're connecting two people on something like this, the impact it can have, the power dynamics between two different people in the mentorship relationship, the education we have to do to the advisors, um, I think most people intuitively think that advice is telling someone what to do. Mm. Um, and on app, our app, that could be so damaging and kind of equivalent to what my godfather did. You know, like you should do advertising. And I went and did advertising without questioning whether that was right for me or not, but it was a person I looked up to. Um, so a lot of the work we're doing right now is finding out what are the formats and shapes of advice that is generally useful to someone um, that helps them form their own decisions based on their own context and that empowers them um, rather than having a, a platform where you call someone who tells you what to do and you might make um, a huge mistake, which that person could, could, could absolutely not conceive of because during five minutes, and I would say even during five hours, it's impossible to under fully understand someone's context in order to tell them what to do. I think no one should ever tell anyone what to do. Most of the time when you have um, the advisors on our platform, I think there is a huge risk for projection as well. Uh, this is what I wish I would have done, or this is um, what I wish I would do now. And then we, we impose that on other people um, for validation or, or for other reasons. So right now we're just figuring, still figuring out what is, what is the, the safest way to deliver advice and the most meaningful thing. Um, so we've gone in our journey, we've gone from ourselves thinking, you know, tell me what to do, what was going to be good to understanding that that's, that's, that could be potentially harmful. And it's also not how people make decisions in life. If, if we're going to go on holiday, we don't ask one person and that person tells us Portugal and then we buy a ticket. We ask lots of different people uh, 
where they've gone, what they enjoyed and why, we piece that together and we say, well, I think this is where I want to go. Um, and that's how it should be with career. That's how it should be with a lot of different things. But then again, it comes back to then your choices um, are basically the effect of your network. Uh, usually you have two or three people who you might talk to your career about, and that's very limiting. And often it's, it's in your own bubble um, and you're met with projection. So now I think the, what we're doing, what we're most excited about on the app is for the ability for people to expand their networks, have incredible people at their fingertips and get lots of different perspectives. Um, and it's much, we're designing it much more so that people can share, kind of can get personalized anecdotes. So I first share context, this is where I'm at. And then the other person shares an experience that might be relevant to that. And then you talk to not that person, but five different people. And through those great experiences you hear about, you kind of piece together um, what you, the decision you want to make. So, so this is really about just like expanding the, the network um, and, and <clears throat> educating people in learning from several different perspectives. And, and also like, I think, uh, and, and feel free to stop me if I, if I go on a tangent, but another like great learning has been that we humans are fundamentally um, very biased in how we think about who we should ask for advice. Um, we think that um, you ask a chef for advice about how to cook or what to cook. But actually, the most relevant thing to ask from a chef is, what is it like to run a, um, an organization under extreme pressure with a high turnaround of staff um, when your output needs to be consistent? I mean, for many people running a business, like a chef is maybe like the most interesting person you talk to, but we would never think that. We would ask, you know, how do you make a sourdough pizza, you know? Um, so that's also education that we're doing, but many times we, we don't realize who might be the most interesting person who will have the most relevant and interesting experience. Um, in, you know, the health category in our app, we have, we have coaches, we have psychotherapists, but also a lot of former professional athletes. And those have been some of the most powerful conversations for people to talk to someone who's been an Olympian uh, about how they manage pressure, stress, etc., uh, and that's really opening up people's minds. Um, yeah, sorry, I, I don't know what really what the question was. I answered. I just started chatting. I think like ten questions popped up in everything that you said. So <laughs> what I, what I found um, what I found so interesting is I used to work for a VC and I was leading. Um, uh, the program for the founders and we had that mentoring day uh, where the founder will meet several groups of mentor um, and then take all the the input let it sit for a few weeks that's usually what I tell them and then probably decide to I don't know change something within their business um, what I find so interested in what you said is that yes we are really biased and I know that a lot of the work we were doing was to prepare them for the input because we knew that some people were great, but some would probably be, I don't know. Um, I mean, everybody's human. So you kind of have a temper or if you see that someone is going away that you don't really, that doesn't make sense, maybe you will say you're completely going wrong. So that we were really trying to train them to receive but then decide for themselves if that makes sense um, and then change something later. So I find that really interesting. Um, and I wonder how do you, you have a diverse um, panel of advisors. How do, you, um, how do you vet them? How do you select them? What is, uh, what is important to you? Because it seems like everybody has wisdom in a way, everybody has experience. But then there's different way to give feedback, to listen, to hold space. So how do you select those people? So, so right now we have an amazing um, woman on our team uh, called Vera, who does, who coaches the advisors first of all, and vets them and makes sure that um, they're fit um, to do it. Uh, we get lots and lots of applications. There, there, there's a 
it's in every day we get so many people who want us to be advisors uh, and we kind of do a bit of desk research um, for us something that's hugely important is kind of representation that when people from a very diverse background get onto the app they should see people like themselves um, so that's a, a very important factor for us um, and also that um, that people seem to have a, a, a genuine kind of um, I mean, that people know what they don't know. I think humility is one of the, the key factors that we look for um, as the people understand on this platform that it's, it's not for definite answers. It's for um, open sharing of, of experiences, perspectives uh, and ideas. Um, yeah. But then, but then also we have in the app, we have a feedback system. So we will also, by the nature of being a marketplace, we will learn a lot from, um, from the callers and how they perceive the calls. And that's one of the things that we've been working the most on. We, we don't want to have, like there is something deeply awkward in the idea of rating people um, and to say, oh, I give this person five stars. Uh, that was because our biases in what can will also be reflected in, in kind of on the receiving end. We might be defensive and think and don't understand that that was great advice. Um, and sometimes it could be the nature of how the advice was delivered, etc. So we're we're building a system which is much more about. Ultimately, we want to help. We want to understand if the advisor is doing a good job, but ultimately needs to help other callers find the right type of advisor. Um, so we're building a system which is much more based on describing the experience in a way that is useful for others. So, for example, this person is 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 very direct and authoritative, um, and and that can be from the person who described that. That can be negative feedback. Didn't enjoy the experience. But there are lots of people who want advice like that, uh, and who actually that's what they're looking for, who will be more receptive to it. So we hope that that kind of um, will be a vetting mechanism that, that is not like, you know, a, a trip advisor experience. I, I, I always use trip advice when I go to the last page, because usually the worst rated places are the best restaurants. Um, and, and usually they, they've gotten one start because I went on a Sunday and they were closed, one stars. Um, and we can have experiences like that on the app as well. Someone uh, can misunderstand a conversation topic and, and call a writer about how to get into journalism school. Uh, and the person is like, I, I never went to journalism school. I, I wouldn't have the faintest idea. And then that person gets a one star rating, for example. Um, that is not, re that is not uh, in any way giving people information about how good that advisor is um it's more of a um you know a misunderstanding um and so on um so hopefully like we we will be able to use technology uh, for part of that vetting that, that's the nature of a marketplace uh, but right now as we are still learning so much and we're so concerned with with safety um we it's very handheld so many questions still um <laughs> Coming back to one thing that you mentioned about um, the chef, like let's say not, not realizing who is the right person to give you advice. Um, what I found interesting is that most of the time we would value someone because of their status. And this is something that you will see on LinkedIn, like hey, I'm blah, 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 under 20, under 30, blah, 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 and Forbes and blah, and Honor here and da, 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 da. Very good. But that doesn't say much about really who that person is. So I wonder, I'm curious about how you present the profile in a way that people don't get, I mean, I'm sure people will write their own description, so I'm sure you don't do that, but I wonder how you can, um, present those profile in a way that that it's really still accessible or that maybe people get curious about people that they would not be uh, in general. Yeah, 
I mean, we, we have an enormous amount of work to do there. I think that's the thing that I'm the most excited about. Um, in all honesty, right now, the profiles are closer to LinkedIn than to a, um, a more kind of informative and, and deeper um, contextualization of that person that we, that we hope for. Um, and I think we're still learning also who it is people want to talk to and where they find the most value. Our hypothesis when we started was probably was very based on our own experiences and where we were at in life. And we thought that people wanted to basically speak to impressive people that they, you know, admired or looked up to. Um, but it turns out that most people want to speak to sort of their, their future self in two years time. Um, and I think that's for a couple of reasons. Um, first of all, like people who are just ahead of you in an experience have not yet created their own narrative um, about why. I think when you're like five years removed from something, you will have made up an amazing story uh, that is far from the truth um, based on just kind of self you know, self-defense mechanisms. I, I'm sure that in, in like five years, my story about why I left Google will, will be very different. Um, but I'm still only like three years away. So I'm still kind of contemplating and reflecting on it. Um, and that's where we've seen um, people have found the most values is talking to someone who became a parent two years ago when you've just had a child and not speak to someone who became a parent 15 years ago who just, you know, like, has created a completely, who's forgotten what the, 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 the early years were like. And it's the same in business. Um, you know, when you, when you read an early interview with, with a founder, they, they will be much more honest about what's going on. And then 15 years later, it's like, I was self-made, you know, you just have to work hard, put in the hours. Uh, and that's like completely irrelevant to speak to a person like that. Um, so I think that's one of the most fascinating things we've learned. And then, you have to then position the people on the platform very differently. And it has to be around experiences and learnings that that person has gone through rather than this like pristine CV. Um, because the more pristine the CV is or the more LinkedInified it is, the less accessible and the less relevant those people um, are seen. Um, so we, we have, I think the most popular people are, are usually people that are positioned as um, you know, who, who puts like, sort of like time context on their experience or, or where they're at and, and what they're working with, or that creates conversation topics that are humble and um, that, sig that, that signals that this is about, you know, process or things like that, rather than five easy steps to make it, like that doesn't work. It's much more struggling as a founder. Let's chat. Um, that's a lot, that, that works a lot better. I like this idea of uh, talking to your potential future self. That's, I, I like it a lot. <laughs> and and um, in the end, probably what makes the advice really um, impactful is the, as you said, the, ab the ability to relate. Then once, once people can relate, like just on the human level and say, this is how I did it. Those are your strengths, weaknesses. Have you tried this and this and this? Mm. Um, that makes it much more powerful than just looking at somebody out there. Um, so I really like that. And do you think that um, the audio is, or just the voice only kind of create this intimate space? So as a singer, I think about this a lot. I think the voice tells so much, can say, today I'm so tired, or I don't know, like there's just so many um, information uh, that goes through the voice. And I wonder um, what you think about that. Uh, yeah, that, that was something, when we started, it was, people thought we were crazy because people loved video calls. Um, and this was before the pandemic. Um, and no one understood why would you do voice only? And we did it because of a couple of just design challenges. People don't like, in order to have a video call, like I did today, I had to go to a place with good Wi-Fi. I had to rush from my home where I have like really terrible um, reception to go to a meeting space, etc. But on the phone, like we 
it would have been so much easier. So voice or, or audio makes it simpler. That's one of the reasons we did it. What we discovered doing it was that we were creating these hugely intimate uh, and immediately like impactful moments where people feel like very, very safe, listened to and heard, and they get, they get, it's, it's very hard to be distracted from a phone call. Um, you're not looking at yourself while, while, you know, which is, I mean, it's, which is an awful experience to see yourself talking. Um, that's like the first time in history we're communicating like that with a mirror as well. Um, and, but we started obviously looking at research and we found an amazing uh, Yale study um, where they had taken hundreds of people who had, had uh, conversations with each other um, in order to see which, which setting and context and format built the most empathy and understanding. Um, and the finding the most powerful um, setting was two people um, together in a dark room. So they were present with each other, but they couldn't see each other. And when you just heard voices and, and you had no distractions, that's when we really listen. Um, I think it's called paralinguistics which is that we communicate an enormous amount, as you say, um, with, with voice. Uh, we listen, when we listen intently, we hear so much more than what we actually, the information we get when we, when we look at someone. Um, and they're starting to find that paralinguistics, I hope that's what it's called, um, is, is more powerful than body language. Um, there's always been that kind of saying that, you know, we communicate 70% with our body. Um, but they're starting to find that actually the voice is, is the most powerful way to, um, to build empathy and understanding. Um, and, and furthermore, with the five minute time cap, you, you're directly put into a situation where we, we kind of skip the small talk and you dive directly into it and you have a problem. So you actually spend um, quite the effort in, in communicating that problem. So we're helping people just like in, in, in therapy where, you know, saying things out loud, you're also realizing things and, and understanding things about yourself. Um, that happens quite quickly uh, in the app that people, for the first time, really puts kind of like the thing they need advice on into the right words. And then it's this like magical experience when someone says back to you, um, right, I understand. Uh, and just those words to have someone say, I understand this is, is extremely powerful. So the phone calls, we had never understood really how powerful and impactful they would be. There's also a fascinating element of calling a stranger, um, which I think is one going to be one of our biggest barriers because it's scary. But when you do it, you, you feel so safe because there's not going to be an effect like that person is not going to take your uh, vulnerability that you have just shared and, and take it somewhere else. You don't, you're not gonna run into them in the street. You're not gonna find out they have friends in common, et cetera. Um, and you're protected as the caller. They know very little about you. So it's, it's a weird analogy, but I think someone, someone compared the experience ones to um, um, AA uh, and being in that safe space where you know it doesn't leave the room, suddenly you can be honest. And there's very few instances in life where we're actually honest. Uh, where we feel like we can do that without any sort of form of, of repercussions. Um, I mean, in this context, it's perfect. Everyone will understand what I'm talking about because of psychotherapy and, and, and coaching and whatnot. But it's not an experience that a lot of people have on a daily basis or a lot of people have ever experienced. Um, and just that makes people like so emotional. We've had people who have, who have been close to tears uh, asking for help with a marketing strategy uh, because they can just, you know, at work, they can't admit to anyone around them that they don't know what the marketing strategy is so that they can't figure it out or et cetera. And then just being in that intimate moment with a stranger where you can finally just admit that, move on, and then hear someone who's like, right, um, have you thought about doing something like this? Or once I did something like this and that really helped me in that situation. And these people cry um, because it's such a relief and it, it's such a, a probably a novel experience, but it, it creates an incredible intimacy and, and feeling of safety, um, which we have realized is quite rare in, in everyday life.
this is so interesting i checking that there's so many still questions on my mind but i'm also checking the time and want to honor the time and honor the time of everybody that is also on the call and give also the opportunity for people that would like to ask questions either on the chat or would like to unmute themselves and i will also uh, stop the recording <laughs>